Over to you, Marcel. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Um, very exciting to uh, explain you some more about Orcus today. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. And um, again, good morning. I'll start with introducing myself a little bit more and then after we'll start about talking about orchids. Um, if questions come in, we'll try to answer them um, as soon as possible in, the, in this meeting and make it a, a good interaction there. Um, yeah, so I'm Marcel Boonkem. I'm uh, with the Green Circle Growers, responsible for uh, the orchids. Um, Green Circle uh, is growing the greenhouse company in Oberlin, um, so uh, southwest from uh, from Cleveland, and uh, started originally 40 uh, over 40 years ago uh, growing bedding plants, uh, which we still do. Um, and as the company got bigger and bigger, um, around 14 years ago, we started in the orchid business as well, which that time was still relatively small in the United States. There were some smaller growers, um, a lot of people that did it for a hobby, uh, which and still a lot of people do, which do a great job. Um, but in the commercial setup, and I will talk a little bit more about that, how we do that, um, it's a little different. And um, But also for Green Circle, there was a totally new business compared to uh, bedding plants, which is really seasonal. Orchid crop for us is an annual crop, which we do sell uh, annually. So over, over the years, uh, the 14 years we're growing orchids, we um, are now 40 acres big on, uh, on, on orchids, uh, all in covered glass houses. And um, different techniques to grow in tropical orchid, uh, a tropical plant in Ohio, which is not a really tropical environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we need greenhouses and different equipment to, uh, to do that. Um, so by now we produce around 9 million orchids a year uh, in different pot sizes. Um, I will show you, yeah, like this one here is a, is a, is a five inch pot, uh, but we grow at three inch and two inch as well. Um, the two inch we call them minis and the three inch we call petites. Um, so a little bit back, background there, uh, how long we've been growing there. Uh, there are different, uh, Greenhouse, uh, like Green Circle, that grow orchids. Green Circle uh, happens to be the biggest uh, of the United States. Uh, and we're growing, uh, we're, the goal is to reach as many people as possible um, and, and to grow the best quality as possible. Um, and that's where, until like 15 years ago, uh, until um, this Phalaenopsis orchid um, became commercially um, more. Um, or able to grow them commercially uh, seen. Um, it came from a little really high-end product, um, which was not re reachable for everyone there, uh, to, um, to a product, product now where you can see in the stores and everyone can buy the plants, um, which is great because everyone gets to enjoy it. Um, but then how, yeah, what's so special about growing orgs in a commercial setup? Uh, it takes a lot of uh, knowledge. It's more of a monocrop. Uh, instead of diversity, we see in nature, which we also see here the botanical gardens in Cleveland, which is great to see the different plants, different, uh, not just orchids, but all kinds of plants, tropical plants. Uh, that's great, but it's not a commercial setup where you can produce a plant uh, in a commercial way that's, um, that is affordable for a lot of people. Uh, so that's why there's where you see the difference as well. And there also, also we see that uh, the market started in Asia. Um, a lot of breeders are still there. Um, Asia is where still a lot of orchids are being produced. There are a lot of breeders, uh, a lot of genetics are from there. Uh, but then uh, European growers uh, took step into that as well. Uh, European breeders uh, stepped into it as well. And now we see that the most professional, big scale, bigger scale um, breeders as well are, are from Europe. Um, horticulture, especially the, the high end in, in glass greenhouses, is really big in Europe. Um, as you might hear, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and that's uh, a leading company, leading country there uh, in, in horticulture. A lot of techniques like our greenhouses, um, automation, a lot of that is uh, from the Netherlands as well. Um, so I grew up 
in and around the greenhouse. Um, my parents growing tomatoes, later cutting roses. Um, and I ran my own business there until 2013. Uh, then fell into orchid business and, and, and we moved with the family this way um, to help Green Circle um, uh, professionalize and get, uh, get better execution of, of the whole orchid crop. Um, and that's where we are now. Um, and so we work together with, uh, still with Taiwanese breeders, suppliers, um, but a lot of European suppliers and breeders. Um, and that's where we try to find the right genetics. Um, to get uh, to good orchid can be, um, you can breed orchids, uh, the breeding is with um, crossing different varieties and you get a lot of uh, seeds from that. If you would, if we would use the seeds, you would get all colors of the rainbow pretty much, um, but you cannot produce it in, in, in commercially set up. So what uh, we do, we buy in tissue culture which is basically means that it's a small plant that's been grown in the lab. Um, what the lab does, um, they have a, a mother stock, basically a plant like this, this variety. Uh, they let it grow they, and they harvest tissue from the stems and they split that in really small chunks. Then they put in agar, which is a kind of gel uh, with uh, nutrition in there um, to make that plant split again. And it splits again and they keep harvesting from that mother stock. Um, so basically from really small tissue, you're making new plants. Um, the nice thing of that, that, that we know for sure that um, if we harvest the tissue from this plant, it basically you clone it. So you get the same color, same uh, um, growth um, specifics from this one, the characteristics from this plant. If you do it by seeds, so even if we have two of this, these plants with the same variety and you do it by seeds, you get might get white, yellow, uh, pink, purple, all kinds of colors from that. So it will be a big mix, which is great in the, for, for if you're a hobbyist, uh, you want to you explore, you want to do things, uh, great. And that's what breeders do as well. Uh, they cross them, they want to get new colors, they want to get uh, better plants. Uh, but we want to be sure if we grow a thousand of these plants that we get thousands of this, this variety, this color, um, with the specifics this variety has. So that's why our, why our vendors uh, supply us uh, tissue culture plants. Really small, this, this size, when they come in. Um, then we um, get them in, we put those plants, we, we sort them in different sizes, um, and then we put them in a block. And that's basically what we call a young plant then. The young plant goes into the greenhouse for 24 weeks, and then it's ready to be transplanted into a five spot. Um, the plant there by then is, is, is this big, so from this big, it's this big. Um, we transplant it into um, a five-inch pot with bark, and then it goes back into the greenhouse and it grows for another 24 weeks um, to become pretty much this size. Um, and though those young plant, that young plant phase and the growing phase for the five-inch, the growing phase basically means it needs to be in 82, 83 Fahrenheit, day and night. Really constant, we don't, we can't allow any dips in temperatures. Um, and so we have all the uh, heating systems, uh, curtain systems to, um, to either uh, for energy savings, right now in winter time it's really cold and to keep the greenhouse at 82 Fahrenheit, um, takes a lot of energy, but we have three different curtains that we close. And then that way we save a lot of energy uh, but it's with the same curtains, we also shade. An orchid plant is a, is a, is a shade plant. Um, it can handle light, but it doesn't really like uh, direct sunlight. Um, so we have different systems there, uh, and we have humidification systems to keep the humidity at the right level. Uh, typically, uh, we are about 60-70% humidity in the greenhouse. Um, and all those factors, light, temperature, humidity, um, uh, and then irrigation and feed, um, and makes the plant grow optimal. So after that 24 weeks, um, and when it's this size, then it's ready to go to cooling. And cooling is, is really colder temperature than 80, 82. Uh, it goes more like 70, 68 to 70. And by that shock, by being colder, um, it starts to initiate that spike. And that's basically what happens in, in, uh, in nature as well. Um, typically, in, 
November to February is a flowering season for, for Phalaenopsis orchid. Um, that's where the temperature in the tropics are a little lower as well, where the flower basically or the plant gets triggered to produce the flowers. Um, that's where we simulate, and that's where we, uh, but in summertime when it's warm in Ohio, uh, we still need that cooling phase. So we have active cooling in the greenhouse to maintain that lower temperature. Um, but the great thing is there, is there that we know the moment we put it in cooling, 18, 19 weeks later, uh, we have a plant with flowers ready to, uh, to ship. Um, so we can really plan ahead and make sure, okay, we want in 90 weeks time, we want so many plants ready to shipping because we have a demand. Um, then we put so many plants in cooling. And so we, for this product, we can uh, really plan. And that is also uh, why do you see Phalaenopsis orchids most in stores? It's because th this plant allows us to plan for it. Uh, we have some special orchids uh, here as well, which honestly, I don't know too much about because uh, we don't grow them. And because commercially seen, they're really hard to grow and also really hard to plan for. If you have a table full of these plants, Maybe this, this week some start to flower, next week or some others, and, and then it takes maybe 10 weeks to really uh, ship that table. And this one, basically within two, one to two weeks, the whole table goes. So we can plan for it, um, which we need to, because we have a demand, our customers ex expect us to produce in time. Um, but also that's not the only thing, like uh, for uh, consumers as well, uh, Phenops Organs have one of the better shelf lives. So it's, it's easy to maintain. It's, um, I'm sure there will be questions how to maintain, but we're gonna to answer that here today. Um, it's easy to maintain, good shelf life. And uh, if you do things right, it can reflower again. Um, so yeah, great, great specs there to make it successful, to have a great experience for your customer as well. Um, and being able to grow it commercially so it's affordable. Um, so that's what we do a uh, green circle, a little bit of the background on, on, on why we grow so many of these uh, versus others, um, other orchids, because they're, they're like hundreds of uh, species of orchids. And, and some are, had, or some, most are gorgeous, they're great. Um, we would like to grow more commercially set up as well, but it comes with a lot of chalices and uh, this is just the most successful one. Um, Starting there, um, I think the question I'm sure a lot of people have, like how do we water uh, the Phelps orchids? Um, most people know overwatering is not good. So at just pouring water every day, uh, that there you don't help the plant. Um, to answer and to understand the process a little better, I will explain uh, how it works in nature as well. I'll take this out. The most, if you buy an orchid, it has that transparent pot. And with that transparent pot, we have that for a reason, because most plants you buy don't have a transparent pot. Um, I'll explain that, that later, uh, what we do with that as well. But in nature, an orchid is an epiphyte, basically meaning that it doesn't grow in the soil, it grows on, on trees where it can be dry, it's dependent on rain, it doesn't have a buffer like plants in the soil have. Um, so it really relies on um, yeah, rain and, um, and it doesn't force, uh, that's why they're, they're there as well, that mostly it rains every day, but it doesn't happen always, plus it's in the shade from the trees. So it's basically on the, underneath the umbrella. So do they get enough rain and water? That's, that's the question. So to understand that better, um, I will break off, I'll try to show that, um, I'll break off a root here. This is, and I'm sure there will be questions about these roots as well versus roots that there are in the pot, but I'll break this one off. It's pretty sturdy as you can see. <laughs> so to hold it a little closer, you basically see a string in the middle and then tissue, tissue around it. And if you do that at home, you will see the same thing there. Basically this string here, that's the root. 
that's what transports the water, the nutrients to the stems, the, the, the flowers, the leaves. Um, so why this around here? Uh, that's basically a, a protection mechanism of a plant that if it rains, and it might be just for a short moment, this is basically dead tissue, but it functions as a, as a sponge. So if it's, if it's raining, if the water drops on it, it will absorb it. So it's still making it available for this root here. So basically allowing it time for this root to uptake that. Um, the great thing of this is what we use, what my growers in the greenhouse use as well, uh, and, and that's part of why we have a transparent pot is that we look at the, at the roots as well every day. Um, in the greenhouse, we water every six, seven days, basically similar to what we advise people to do at home. Um, but the moment of watering in a greenhouse is, is uh, essential and um, maintaining good quality, getting new roots out of there. So we don't want to overwater, but we don't want to be too late. The plant gets too dry, uh, we lose growth. Um, we might not see it right away, but we, we, we want to maintain that speed of growth. Um, so what we do, and I will explain that plant here, that is a little dry, not too dry, but it's a little dry. And then I will get one that I just watered just before the presentation. Um, pull it up. Oh, I can. Yeah. Okay. As you can see, there's a difference in color. So this one is dry, where the roots turn white, silver is white. And that means they are dry. That dead tissue basically has this color. But the moment you water it, and that goes pretty quick, it can be like 10, 30 minutes that those roots turn dark green. So you can see the, the difference. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen it at home yet, yeah, you can you can do the test as well. And um, the fast way to hold it, uh, need the faucet and let the water run through it. Uh, then you can see it real quick. Um, but that's the difference. So in the greenhouse, there we our growers as well. They they lift up plants, look at the roots. If they see this, they know for sure they don't have to water. If they see this, then then it comes time. They will probably determine, okay, tomorrow we have to water. So very, very handy for us to, to know, okay, how can we water best for the plant and how can we check on that? Um, there we got a big question we get always like, why are we, are we as we should have the, the brand just that ice? And, and so we really recommend uh, people to water with ice cubes um is it better than water no water is fine because ice ice is basically water as well as it melts um but the thing is that um this root needs time to absorb the water bark is not the best doesn't have the best water holding capacity so if you might have experienced as well if, if you have a plant that you pour water over it most drains out right away uh, not allowing the, the root to absorb that water so well, with ice cubes, if you put them on top of the, the pot here, on top of the bark, it will that melt slowly. And, and by the drips that fall off, the, the bark and the roots have time to absorb that. So basically what you see is that you don't have sitting water uh, in the bottom of the pot. Uh, first, if you have a cup of water you pour over it, you will have sitting water there, which is most likely not available for the plant. And so it's a really easy way to water. Um, because it's the main main thing to get to keep the plant healthy, uh, the right water watering method. Um, again, water works, but it's uh, I think ice cubes it's it's it's, it's kind of foolproof. It, you can know how to dose, um, but then again, it also depends on uh, we we recommend at three to five ice cubes every week. That depends a little bit on on what spot uh, in the house, so how how bright it is. Um, and, and or how dark um, is, it, is there a draft or not, which, which would dry out the pot faster. Um, so on the amount of water, uh, three to five ice cubes, but knowing the color of the roots, if you do five ice cubes a week, which should be enough, 
but it might be on a brighter spot. Uh, and, you, and you still see uh, the day after watering, you still see that, that light color roots, which they, they like to get this dry and not too dry, but that's still a little bit of green in there. Uh, and you don't see the roots shrinking yet. Uh, but if you see the day after watering, that's still this color, you might as well do a little bit more. Uh, and if, if you don't fit more ice cubes on it, uh, what I sometimes do at home as well, or actually my son is doing that, um, um, just once a month, uh, we, we just hold it underneath the faucet and let the water run to really refresh it um, and make it all wet again. And then for four weeks, we do just ice cubes as well, um, depending how, how the root color looks, but to keep it real simple, ice cubes work, um, water works, but ice cubes, it's easier to dose. It's once a week, you put them on there and they're ready to go. Um, but I know most of, of you uh, have an interest in the plants, want to know more, uh, want to do it right. So that's that's why a little bit more advanced is just to look at the colors, color of the roots, and if needed, uh, do more ice cubes or once in a month, a little bit of extra water and let it run through. Uh, then I get questions as well about fertilization, right? So, um, yeah, we do recommend fertilization. Um, so uh, with nutrients, um, special for orchids. Um, do you need to? Um, no, a plant, we, uh, we, we use nutrients in the greenhouse. Uh, the bark absorbs it, lets it, that releases it slowly as well. So if you do, if you buy a new orchid, uh, and you don't fertilize for the first three weeks, nothing wrong with that. Um, I think that's the plant gets older, um, that most of the nutrients have been released out of the bark. Um, yeah, then, then it will be time to, to fertilize that as well. Although I have to say, uh, don't overdo it. Uh, it's definitely not needed to do it every week. Uh, once a month would be enough um, and little doses. So um, don't do too much. What, if you do too much, the, the roots will burn. Um, it's, it's that salt level, uh, which we call EC. It's, 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 it's the salt level gets too high, the roots burn, and you basically do more harm than good. Um, so be careful with fertilization. Um, first three weeks, four weeks, no need to after you buy a plant. But as I think most of you um, that really love your organ, you can take good care of it they will last, they can last for years. So yeah, then uh, uh, when, as they become older, the more important it is to do that. Um, so, and if you have fertilized, don't put it straight on there, mix it in with water. So it's a lower concentration and then put it in there. Um, and you can do that with, uh, with water. Um, I know some people even make, uh, uh, they make water with nutrients and then make ice cubes of those. That's possible too, uh, but it's an extra step. Um, but water, mixing in nutrients in there and then pour it over, uh, that works uh, perfectly fine as well. Um, often what you do see, and uh, doesn't have to be only that, if you do see that roots don't go into the bark anymore, and they only want to go up and make air roots, uh, they have the new roots you produce, could be a sign that the, their, the top layer is too salt, that you're over, overfeeding them. Um, could be one of the reasons. Um, either that or the plant is so, so old that um, the bark is not good anymore. The, the roots just don't want to go in there. Um, that brings us to the next topic. It's like, yeah, uh, uh, questions we often get, do I need to repot um, my plant either into a bigger pot or fresh bark? Um, and yes, if the roots, if it only produces uh, air roots, and that typically happens with older plants, then it might be time to, uh, to repot. And um, I would say first six months to 12 months, you don't have to do that. It should be fine for, for a year in, the, in this pot. Um, but it depends on, on the plant location, how you deal with it. So it's a lot of variables to play a role, but as first first year typically is not needed. Uh, but as plant, these plants can come old and at five to 10 years is very possible. Um, it, will, it will appreciate a fresh bark uh, fresh media. And as the plant gets bigger, a bigger pot size uh, is recommended as well. Um, 
basically what you what you do if you if you do that you take the whole plan out uh, i'm gonna do it here we'll be making a mess but um you take it out to shake all the old bark off uh you leave the roots as they are uh don't don't break any roots unless they're the air roots um but all the roots down here you want to keep them intact and then um place it in a bigger uh, pot and then pour the bark around the, the roots uh and that that Important is that the depth of the plant um, is similar similar to this. So we call this the crown, where basically the the, the spikes come out of. Um, that needs to stay above ground. So all leaves need to stay above ground. That's important. So not too deep, because if you do it too deep, you have the chance that it uh, starts to rot and the plants will get sick. Okay. I'm not sure if any questions pop up. Mm -hmm. this yeah, point. we've got uh, several questions if you're ready. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go okay. Yeah. All right. So somebody had actually just asked if you could see the questions. And so for everyone who's been typing them in, no, he hasn't been able to see them. Okay. Uh, we've been waiting up until this point to be able to give you a chance at home to kind of answer some of your own questions by just uh, learning these basics about potting, the roots, how to water them. Um, and so now if you still have a question and you haven't entered it, you can enter it into the chat box. If you have an ORCID issue that is visible that you'd wanna show on video, then that's something that you can do too. Um, but I do have some, I've been communicating with some of the people who asked first, and it sounds like I can just read off their questions. So um, Tracy had asked in the beginning, do you cut your stems down after the blooms have faded? Good question, yeah. Um, yes, we do. Um, typically, what sometimes happens is that, um, you see here, what we call notes. So like that stripe? Yeah, that stripe, this one is clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we call notes. Sometimes it happens that you get a side branch here. Uh, if that happens, you get new side branch here, um, yeah, this this organ has one. So this is what we call the side branch. Um, sometimes it happens that this one continues to grow, or once these are falling off, that a new side branch is coming in, and then I would recommend to cut it off just above that side branch. So then this will basically become a new branch that starts to flower. Uh, if this one has been there since the start, since you bought it or, or uh, got it from someone, um, then I would say, yeah, this, this one probably won't flower anymore. What we do then, if this is sometimes this stem even turns yellow or brown, what we don't then recommend is, is cutting it off just above that first or second node. Uh, so it's about an inch to two inch high. Cut it off. And when you cut it above that first node or second node, is that to, just in case you'll get another side branch at that node? Yeah, there there is a possibility that it will start a new uh, spike just from that node there. Um, most of the time, it will um, use a new spike up higher uh, in in that crown here. Oh, so uh, along the stem, the actual stem. Where yeah, the, along the. The plant itself. Mm -hmm. So basically, how how this one was initiated out of that crown, uh, it will do that again, but then one leaf higher. Okay, so you guys at home see how there's like almost a zigzag where you've got a pair of leaves here, a pair of leaves here, and then another pair of leaves. So what you're saying, Marcel, is kind of in between each pair or set is where you might get a branch coming up or a spike. Yep. Yeah, okay. might get. That's not guaranteed, of course. What it often does is that uh, it will start to produce a leaf first. So uh, orchids, the lower, the older they are with the leaves. So it produces leaves from the heart here. So what, basically, if it's flowering, it's it's concentrating on that. It will not produce. It's not likely to produce a new leaf. Once you once it's blown out, they fall off. Uh, you spike. You got the spike off. Then often the plant is, is is wanting to to create make a new leaf first because um, that's what we what I said in the beginning as well what we do in the greenhouse we want to grow them um, to this this size of plant um, if they're too small it doesn't have the energy and cannot produce energy to 
uh, push that spike out. Uh, same goes for after this one, the plant wants to build more strength. So we'll produce that new leaf, which at home probably takes about three months to, uh, to fully grow that leaf. So don't expect a new spike there if it's working on that. Sometimes it does, but most of the time it doesn't. So it can take up to uh, six to 12 months to get a new spike. So a little bit of patience is required to, uh, to do that. But um, at, if, you see, if you see a new leaf coming out here, it's a good sign because it means that the plant is happy, it's healthy. It has probably a good root, si root system to produce that. So let that leaf grow, let it come out. Uh, and then after, uh, it's likely that it, they, you will get a new spike. Um, but again, back to the roots. If you don't have good roots, it's not likely that you will that it will produce spikes. Sometimes it does. Sometimes, not just orchids, but a lot of plants they produce flowers if they're stressed. Um, so yeah, if you're too good for your plant and they're not stressed at all, then <laughs> that might not help. But that's not a that's not a good advice. You need to have good roots. To, to produce that new leaf, to produce new spikes. Okay, so on the subject of those spikes, uh, Jen had a question too, um, saying that she has a small orange orchid that had two perky, beautiful blossoms for about two weeks. And then suddenly, a couple of days ago, the stem turned red. So maybe the spike turned red, yeah. And the flowers dropped immediately, or maybe drooped. This morning, they fell off. Oh, that's when they dropped. But another stem on the same plant is still green and has several healthy buds, one of which is opening. So what happened to the red stem and how does she keep that from happening to the other stem? Um, that's a hard one to answer because, um, yeah, what, what happened with that stem? Um, did it break or did it crack here? Sometimes that happens. Um, it's an option, maybe it didn't. What sometimes happens is that uh, one side of the, typically, this one, this one is more unique because it has two stems coming out of the same side. Um, what you normally see, like with this band, you have one left and one right. Um, what we sometimes see is that if this side starts to become yellow, and, and yeah, it's called fusarium, uh, it's the most common disease, um, which is not risky for us at all, but it's, it's, it's more of a, a fungus um, that, grows inside the, the plant and, and, and attacks the plant from the inside. A healthy plant is, is able to resist that, uh, to continue to grow. Sometimes if, if you see that this one is yellow or it's, it's a little black around the crown, um, might be a sign that it's there. It might have stopped, but impacted this stem already. Um, that, that is possible that that happened. Um, especially like you're saying that the other one is healthy and, and flowering. Um, that is a little hard to explain. Yeah, it's not really common, I would say. Um, but a good sign that the other one is at least is flowering. Uh, something must have happened with this, the other stem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, with that, um, people at home, if you're able to show us your orchid, that might help because of things like that, where there's a lot of different things that um, could cause your issue. Sometimes there's a visual indication that the orchid doctor can see. Yep. Um, so it could be a change in the environment or it could be something yeah that you actually see on the plant um so i hope that answered that question so far uh so now sharon has a question about uh, what we were talking about earlier and watering is soaking the plant an appropriate solution for dehydrated wilted leaves uh soaking plant meaning the pot probably right yeah soaking that um no, it's a, it's a good quick solution to, uh, if you find out that your plant is really too dry, uh, especially not maybe knowing already, or maybe after today, after explaining about the roots, um, it's the quickest reset moment for that plant to really soak it. Uh, you can use your ceramic for that, uh, hold it on the faucet, let it overflow and let it sit in there. Uh, not too long, but five minutes is okay uh, to really have that, that bark and root uh, absorb all that water. Um, yeah, definitely if, if you feel like that, the, 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 especially the bottom leaves are starting to wrinkle or are getting soft, um, that's where you know it's, it's, it's too dry. Uh, typically the plants try to, um, to protect the youngest leaves because they're most productive. And if it needs to lose a leaf, it will 
and we'll lose the, the bottom leaves. Um, so yeah, definitely too dry, uh, soaking it, that's a, that's a good option. You should not have to do it every week because the, the ice cubes uh, should be enough. Um, if, you feel, if you feel like you're not keeping up, like we said, yeah, then up the ice cubes or soak it uh, every, uh, every month. All right, thank you. And the next question is about uh, Ava's orchid. She had lost all the flowers and left it in the corner, meaning to throw it away with no water. And she was shocked when several months later it bloomed the most beautiful orchids. <laughs> How could this yeah. happen with no water? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's more coming back to that stress level. Uh, okay. Where again, it's not a good advice to do it, but sometimes it works. Um, that plant is stressed. You know, it's a survival mechanism. It kicks in and it, a flower it needs to, to reproduce. It needs flowers. Uh, that's a, a natural instinct uh, of the plants. Um, so yeah, you can be too good, uh, but this is an extreme one, which uh, sometimes it works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people are curious about reblooming and how that happens. So I think uh, uh, that that might have helped with some some of the other questions in this chat box. But we do have one that I don't see very often, and that's about um, Dory's orchid. She has a kiki on one plant. And what does it mean and what should she do? Yeah, uh, I had to call it a kaiki. Oh, um, kaiki. A kaiki, yeah. Um, basically, uh, it probably would be nice to have a visual, but it probably grows around halfway to stem. Sometimes at the top, but most of the time it happens here. Basically, it's, it's a kind of, um, could be a mistake by the plant or a stress moment uh, that a new leaf starts to grow on the stem basically creating a new plan. It could also be a, a survival um, response to where maybe the roots in here are rotten, they're gone, there are no new roots. Uh, the only way to survive, and that's in nature, like this stem is now perfectly straight up. In nature, it might be hanging uh, close to the branch of the tree as well. It will make a kaiki and then new roots, basically starting a new plant from there. And that old, the old one might die completely, but then that this one continues to grow. And that's basically what you see. Um, is it because this one is bad or dying? Maybe not. Sometimes it just happens. Um, but typically that is the case. All right. Um, we had a couple of questions about leaves um, from some different people. Um, this happens a lot and uh, it has to do with floppy leaves. So they're not necessarily wrinkly or having changed colors, but they're just really floppy. Um, what, what can you say to that? Uh, it's a little varietal. We try to, where we select our varieties on is it's, it's compact leaves. So this one is a great example. This is basically how we want it. Uh, why do we want it? Because we want to produce and more on, within the same service, we want to optimize that. And um, actually this variety here has wider leaves, uh, bigger. Um, it's, it's not a perfectly, because in the greenhouse we start pot to pot. So basically all the plants are touching each other. Um, and to, so that for us, that's the reason to make more, uh, more of a compact plant. And that's how we select. That's how breeders try to produce uh, new varieties with more compact. Uh, big leaves is not at home. It's not bad. Um, why are they floppy? Could be that uh, when you purchase it, it's just a, a varietal issue. Most of the time, it's, it's, it's um, they get stressed, stretched, um, so longer, and then uh, not enough energy to to stand up. So it could be happening in a, in a darker place. In, if your plant is in a dark place. Uh, so not enough light, it, it will stretch, it will still grow, but then it becomes floppy. Um, and again, that's yeah, not sure if that's the case, but, um, but I would advise to find a, a more uh, lighter spot for that plant. That, that leaf that is floppy and stretched yeah, will not recover so much. It might get stiffer, but it will still uh, maintain that shape. The new one though should become more compact and, and, and more straight up. Um, so, yeah, talking about light, we haven't touched it too much, but uh, it's a shade plant, but it needs light. 
Um, so what we typically say is the south side of the house next to the window is not the best place because you have a lot of straight, straight sunlight there. Uh, northeast, nothing wrong with that. West is even good. Um, and um, But if you have it on, on your uh, kitchen island or anywhere there, uh, that's fine too. Uh, if you, as long as you have some indirect sunlight, um, that, that, is, that, that is enough for the plant to survive. But uh, really to respike, um, we need some more light, we need some more energy. Uh, so the window often helps on light, but also, um, especially in wintertime, uh, during the night, the glass gets cold, plant temperature gets lower as well, which helps that, that initiation of that spike. So um, typically to, to get new spikes, when, when the old ones are gone, you cut them off, yeah, next to a window um, where it can become bolder, it's basically your best bet to, to get new spikes. Okay. Um, this might be a good point to talk about. Well, I'm just looking at the next question and thinking about the questions that we've had answered so far, and them mostly being about phalaenopsis that just add ice orchids. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I have a question coming up that's about a specific, you know, species of orchid that hasn't been mentioned yet today. And that happens a lot. People, um, you know, orchids are so diverse. Yep. that it's hard to know what to do for each specific type. So I was wondering if you wanted to keep it to Phalaenopsis today and then offer people uh, the opportunity to ask questions via your social media account. That is, but we, we, can, we can try to answer some okay. questions. Uh, again, uh, we, this is the only org we grow. Mm -hmm. um, typically, org is uh, um, a lot is similar um, to how the roots behave different that different uh, size of root maybe but the structure is often the same and it doesn't apply always but for a lot of orchids uh, so yeah we can go ahead and, and try to uh, explain okay that. um so mk was gifted a platy steel reflexa orchid uh, with little to no care instructions so the good part is that you know what kind it is um it was blooming for over five months and now it stopped we water it about one teaspoon a day and try to feed it every six months. Looking for any care advice you can provide us um, because they haven't been able to find much information on market. Okay. Sounds like good care because it bloomed for, for a long time. Um, at a, a teaspoon or spoon a day uh, of water. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like a good amount to not overwater. Um, typically it's better to do it twice a week or once a week to give that amount, or not that amount, but adding that, that to uh, multiply it by seven. Um, but if it works, it, it might as well work. Uh, what you do get is that uh, if you do one spoon every day, the top layer gets wet, but then the lower part uh, will most likely stay dry, um, I, would, I would guess. If that's not the case, then, then maybe keep doing it. Uh, but that might be possible that the top is wet, but the bottom is too dry. Um, so and. Most likely, like like this orchid, and you have a you have a black pot, so you can really see it. Um, and to take it out might be risky because if, if everything falls apart, then you're not helping the plant. Um, so it sounds like good. I think um, also on on what spot it is, if it has enough light, um, some orchids can definitely handle more light than than uh, phalaenopsis orchids. So finding finding that spot, but it, it sounds like uh, you're doing a lot right. Um, but then a lot of special orchids, uh, they're even more challenging to, to rebloom. And um, for example, and then the yeah, visual would, would again help, but uh, like, uh, like types like this, like dendrobium types, um, they have those canes. Once those flower, um, Basically, you either you need to leave, so you probably put it better off leaving them on, but it should produce another cane, basically. Whereas an phenopsis orchid yeah, is producing more leaves from the from the heart. Uh, orchids like this really have to produce a new cane to to produce a new flower. Um, so if you start to see those coming, yeah, then it's then it's really a matter of time to have letting them grow and, and, and hopefully start and have producing new flower. I have the plant on video if you oh, want great. It's very tiny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, okay, I removed the spotlight. So who was oh, it? Oh, sorry. It's um, yeah, there you go. planted in uh, sphagnum moss, but the flowers are like this big when they bloom. It's very, very small. Oh, I'm not familiar with a plant like that, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm questioning where it came from, um, but I couldn't find anything online right. at all about taking care of it. So it's, it's interesting to see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you found a really special one, yeah. Um, yeah. It looks healthy. It looks really... Okay. There's a lot of... Uh, I think if it, as long as it produces new leaves as well, that's what you want to see. Then, okay. then it's like, then you, you're more, more hopeful to re, uh, rebloom. Awesome. Uh, it doesn't produce any new leaves yet, and it's just becoming older. And okay. Assume, but again, I don't know anything about this one. <laughs> but you're doing a good job. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it looks healthy. Yeah. So, also, is, yeah. um, there the next question was actually about how long blooms last, and maybe going into what that last question was, we could talk more about how often you would expect an orchid to bloom. Okay, yeah. Now uh, the first one, um, how long does it last? Um, that is basically friedel. So what we do, um, and we, like I said, we're selecting uh, plants on the leaf size, on how tall the spikes become, because uh, they're beautiful orchids, Phenops orchids, that, uh, that become this tall, and big flowers, this tall, but uh, that doesn't suit us well, because we have to uh, transport it over uh, 48 states in Canada. And if we have, we can only fit so many in the truck that uh, then it will be hard. So we select a certain size, certain flower size. But one of the big selections for us is a shelf life. So what we do, uh, we test varieties. Um, and typically there's a long process because from breeding a new variety takes already five to seven years for the breeder. Um, then we get those little tissue cultures in, and then it takes us about a year and a half to produce that tissue culture into a flowering product. And then we're looking at a new variety and then we're looking at all the specs and we say, okay, um, yeah, right height, uh, a lot of spikes, uh, good flower size, enough flowers, we got all those things. And then it might look great. And then we put it in our test room where we sh test shelf life and some varieties really have a poor shelf life. And then it can be the best, nicest looking flower uh, plant, but if it doesn't have a good shelf life, we decide not to grow them. Um, because we want the consumer to have a great experience with the organ. Um, so what we, basically what we have in, in our assortment uh, should have passed our shelf life testing. Um, so receiving the plant, and um, even if it's this ripe as this, uh, where it only one pot left, um, Typically, it's even better if you receive them that way, because if it's too green or a lot of buds, um, you might have a chance that the buds fall off. But typically, it should last like two or three months. Um, some varieties do six months. That's uh, some varieties just they, they keep their flowers forever, um, which is great, uh, but not all do. Then you have the uh, uh, variable of yeah, do your watering time, um, and, and that, is it in the right spot in the house? Um, bright, too bright, um, too dry or too wet. But basically what we see, if it comes too dry, then your shelf life goes down quickly. Um, although if you overwater, it, it drops as well. So again, starts with the roots and watering. If that's correct, then it should last for two or three months and maybe even longer. Okay. Um, so now it's about 1127. So I know that we're getting close to what we had scheduled. So for people that aren't planning on staying any longer, uh, just want to remind you that we'll be able to send out the recording of this. But I also wanted to, uh, for people to know how to reach you if they have questions that don't get answered during this session. Uh, so what was the, um, what was the social media account that they could reach you at? Is it, is it just at ice? Yep. Okay, just so ice. just at ice. And is that on Instagram? Instagram, Instagram and Facebook. So if you're more of a Facebook person and your question wasn't able to get answered yet, uh, then you can go ahead and get a hold of uh, these folks at just at ice on either Facebook or Instagram, and they'll be happy to answer. 
that's uh, something that they're used to doing. Um, and then there is actually something pretty cool that someone had um, offered to do. I wanted to see if Sharon is still able to do this. She had an example of one of those pipes. Sorry, I got to meet that person. That wasn't Sharon. Sharon, are you still able to do that for us? Yes. So okay, here cool. is. Um, I'll, I'll spotlight you. Growing on a flower stalk um, yep. of a plant that had two two plants in the pot and um, and then the keiki just started. It's my second keiki. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, first, oh my so gosh, so those are two red colored leaves, right? Yeah, they're red. This one was a keiki. This was the mother plant. That's why I asked about floppy leaves because it's not doing very mm. well. But I cut the keiki off of this stalk up here and replanted it with the mother. So this, this one is the keiki that's in bloom. And this is the original mother plant and the stem that the keiki that's, came off of. Yeah, that, that's very cool. And it also has some new flower um, spikes that are branching out because I didn't cut the stalk all the way back. Okay, right. Sharon, I think what you need to do is reveal your secret. <laughs> what are you doing yeah. to these things? Are you putting them in the corner and not giving them water? <laughs> <laughs> no, and they're actually right now on a south window, which he just said we're not supposed to do. So, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. so uh, that's very funny. There's no, there's no one best way to do it. Right? We, <laughs> we recommend those and yeah, some plants handle it, right? And they, uh, they even do better. Um, it's a little trial and error as well. It's, then that's that's even a thing in the greenhouse, right? We have we sometimes say we we're in a in a race car. We have the light. We have all the things that to take care of the plant. In the house, you don't have that as much, and not, not as much control. Because what it organizes most is stability. Every day the same temperature, light, uh, and, and that. But yeah, if if you're not at home, the lights are off, or it's a sunny day, or whether or it's a dark day, the circumstances are different. Sometimes it's even better to get that reach bike, but it's so it's really funny to hear and then great to hear that uh, everyone experiences it in a different way. And that's, it's like people, right? No one is the same and it's the same with plants as well. All need a diff different treatment. <laughs> okay, so um, we did end up starting a little late. So uh, we can, we're gonna ask a couple more questions just to kind of even things out. Um, and I wanted to just, kind of curate and pick out some questions rather than going exactly in order. I wanted to ask about some topics that haven't been brought up yet. And uh, somebody has asked the question about how to deal with mealy bugs. Um, so I thought that that was a pretty important one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, we haven't touched on uh, insects or disease too much. Uh, overall, an, an, a phenopsis organs is, is not sensitive to, to insects or anything like that. Uh, luckily, we don't have to control much. We, we do control with chemicals if need to, but we, as a standard, we have a biological uh, control. So either predatory mites, um, nematodes that uh, help uh, attack fungus nets, for example, stuff like that. Um, Mealy bugs we never see in a greenhouse. Um, are they not there? I don't know. But mealy bugs are, are yeah, growing real slow and reproducing real slow. But once you have it, it's a really pain to get get rid of it. Um, so if you have them, that's hard. I, I would say, and for people that don't know what mealy bugs are, they're, they're, they're in the aphid family, um, and, but they have a kind of woolly substance around them, which protects them um, even for chemicals. So uh, I don't want to recommend it, but even if you would use a chemical, you really have to hit it hard. Um, so what some people do is uh, water with soap, a big, a big amount of soap in there and spray them in. The soap will dry them out. Um, so that could be uh, an option to, to do that. The, the, hard, the hardest thing is that they, they're not just on the leaves most of the time. They can, they can travel, but they don't travel much and real slow, but often they're really in the corners of the leaves and really uh, the spots that are hard to reach. Um, soaking them in water or spraying them off with water, maybe on the faucet you can have a, a some rinsing water on there, trying to soak them off, uh, even rubbing them off with a paper cloth. Uh, that all helps to control. Um, to be honest, if I find find one in my house, which I I haven't, but uh, if I would, to be honest, I would dump my plant. Especially if you, uh, and I know that's painful, 
especially if you have more plants and you really love your plants, they're sitting there for years and you find one plant with lily bugs and it could be from an orchid, could be from a different plant you've bought, I would dump the plant to be honest, because you have a, it's likely that they will uh, um, and that they will go over to the other plants. And then you have all your plants, the plants you love, the plants you have for years. Um, that would be my recommendation because they're really hard to, uh, to stop. Okay. So then uh, for our last question, uh, I just wanted to move over to the pots. I know you've talked a little bit about that, but I had multiple people ask specifically about like how much bigger the new pot should be. And then um, somebody had mentioned some slots. So maybe you could speak on whether or not the slots are important in a pot. Um, and just lastly, kind of bundled into that question, somebody had mentioned seeing what looked like some mold inside or mildew or something like that inside their pot. So I okay. thought maybe we could pack those all into one. Yeah, so if we um, uh, repot, uh, it's basically yeah, it's better to go to bigger pot size. Does it have to be big? No. Uh, this is five inch, even going to a six inch pot um, is, is big enough. I think we have uh, kits as well, right? We sell. Yeah, so on the website we have uh, kits where you have a bigger pot with uh, with bark, fresh bark, and, and things like that to to do that. So basically, oh, a repotting kit. Yeah, a oh, okay. repotting kit. Um, so you don't have to go to a big size pot because the, the the problem then is if you do it in a, in a big pot, you can't see the roots anymore. Uh, uh, watering and, and and how much you have to water is harder to check. Uh, so that that is the recommended step to do. Um, but into a bigger pot, it works as well. If you like that, you want to do that, you want to mix it in with different plants or more orchids together, uh, that is possible. Um, we sell planters as well, but then we do the individual uh, plants in a ceramic, in a planter, uh, to keep the plants separate, but at home you could put them together as well. Um, but standard is little size, one step bigger is enough to, uh, to make the plant uh, happy again. Um, then if you look at the, what kind of pot, maybe if you have a pot already or you're looking at buying one, uh, our pots here have holes in the bottom there. Um, so you definitely want a pot that drains. Um, and a little bit of sitting water is okay, but it doesn't definitely needs to be able to drain out that, you, that your, not your whole pot is, is floating uh, water. So that, that's important. The plant is not always sitting in water. Okay, answers. Oh, question. All right. Yeah, and I've noticed that there are sometimes pots with slots on the sides, and I think that's for air circulation, right? Yeah, it's not necessary. Okay. Right. All right. So, um, just once again, wanted to uh, remind everyone that if they have any questions that didn't get answered today, that it's uh, best to go ahead and just get a hold of Just Add Ice on social media for a quick response. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, another option is to just join us again um, on the 13th or 27th of next month. We'll be doing some more Orchid Doctor sessions. And will it be you who's back the next time? Uh, from yeah, we're planning on the 27th. Okay. Right? 27th of March. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you like this Orchid Doctor, you can come back to ask this specific person a question. Uh, we take turns with different Orchid Doctors. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining us. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share before I sign off? Thanks for joining as well. Uh, pleasure to do this. It's, uh, it's great for us uh, as, as, as growers to see uh, where we spent almost a year and a half to get this plant into the store. Uh, yeah, the people are taking care of it. They, uh, they, they grow it for years. It's, it's great to see and finding their own ways uh, to make that plant uh, grow successfully. So yeah, no, it's, it's great feedback. It's great to see. And uh, I, I love the passion. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, everyone. Um, it's This is where we get our orchids from for uh, all of our Phalaenopsis for this show. So it's wonderful to see them in mass, all those beautiful colors. If you follow their social media, you'll see pictures of what those uh, moth orchids look like in the greenhouse. Uh, and then if you go on their website, maybe you can pick up one of those potting kits. Uh, but thanks everyone for joining us and be on the lookout for the recording and uh, maybe we'll see you again. Also, just, just to let you know, Marcel, you're getting a lot of thank yous and a lot of okay. appreciation in the chat box. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
All right, I'm gonna stop recording.